Hello, friends. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Schoolyard Podcast, brought to you by School Specialty. I'm your host, Nancy Chung, a fun loving teacher and content creator, also known as Fancy Nancy and Fifth on social media, and I'm thrilled that you're here. A special shout out to School Specialty, who offers essential educational supplies and complete learning environment solutions to help you transform more than classrooms. This is the Schoolyard Podcast, a podcast by educators for educators where the magic of learning unfolds. Schools are not just places of education, they're also a second home and a safe space for students. However, when learning is also nurtured at home, students thrive and succeed in the classroom. In this episode, our guest Kimberly Gorelick and I will be discussing the benefits of family engagement and how that can fuel student involvement. Kimberly, the author of Hacking Parenthood, is the Director of Strategy at We Are Teachers and has 15 years of classroom teaching experience and a master's degree in literacy education. Welcome to the schoolyard, Kimberly. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Would you please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Sure. My name is Kimberly Goralek. I uh, currently live in Maine, right near Portland. Um, I'm the director of strategy for We Are Teachers. But before that, I was a teacher for 15 years. I taught first grade, I taught middle school, I was a gifted and talented teacher, and I did some literacy intervention work. I've also written for a lot of publications, and my book, Hacking Parenthood, was published in 2017. That's of importance to our conversation, really, because it's the final book in the Hack Learning Education series designed to help parents engage with school and teachers more as a way to help their children thrive in school. Oh my gosh, I need to get a copy of this book immediately. (laughs) So we're going to dive right in with our topic today. And the question is, our first question for you is, what does family engagement mean to you? And who benefits from family engagement? Well, I know I'll tell you what I think it means to me. But also, I did look up the American Psychological Association definition, just so we'd have that kind of as a as a you know benchmark, um, they define it as parent engagement in schools, as parents and school staff working together to support and improve the learning development and health of children. So for me, that means that families are given an opportunity to learn about what their child does during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's really important because um, for most people, the only time the experience they have, is when they were a child. And you have a very different perspective of school as a child than you do as the parent of a child in school. Mm -hmm. And so much has changed since these parents were students themselves. And I think that a lot of the parents who need to understand what's happening with their child in school so they can really communicate with them are parents who may have have not had a great experience at school. And so they're unlikely to try to make those connections because they think that they can't be had. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to come up with as many ways as you can to help parents um, feel like their school's, their child's experience at school is transparent Mm -hmm. and that they know the right kinds of questions to ask. And I guess Mm -hmm. by that, I mean, The first time I realized um, how different my children's perspective was um, to have me as a parent was because I was a teacher. And so and I actually taught in the school district where my kids went to school. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day or on the way home, I could say things like, did you like today's assembly? Wasn't it funny when this happened? Mm -hmm. And so it was like I was a part of things. And so their responses are very different to that than you know, if someone says, what was your favorite part of the day, which is people love to start that out. But unfortunately, Mm -hmm. it's a little like bringing a toddler into Target and saying, you can have whatever you want, (laughs) Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. There's just too much, I think. And so it's great to be able to say, you know, something like the hot lunch looked like something you'd like. Did you pick that today? Or did you get Mm -hmm. the sandwich? And Mm why? Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the kinds of things that I think parents um, would love to to know how to ask their kids, or it seems like it's common sense because we're around Mm -hmm. kids all the time. Mm -hmm. But when you're a parent, I feel like 
they need to be given really explicit understanding and instruction the same way we would expect to give to our own kids mm -hmm. in our classroom of, you know, here are some questions you can ask. Here's how you can find out that information. Mm -hmm. You have a menu. And so look at the lunch. I mean, I know lunch seems like, um, you know, something that's not as critical, but it's a great starting point, I feel like, mm -hmm. for parents. Mm -hmm. And I like I like the specific questions that you're mentioning because a lot of times parents might just ask like ask their kids how was your day and they say fine and it ends the conversation. So right. to find specific questions like that and and giving parents these tools or these like sample questions like discussion starters like I think that would be a great way to start. Now you mentioned like teaching first grade all the way to middle school and in your 15 years of classroom teaching. Do you see a correlation between family involvement and student success, whether it's like behavior or academic? Well, I definitely do. And I can give you some examples. But I also did look up a study um, that said uh, the Department of Education, the whole the United States Department of Education, um, did a study on 71 high poverty schools and found that when teachers were active in outreach to families and in students reading in math scores, like just in explaining what they were and how the testing worked and how the um, the rationale of the way they taught that uh, students reading in math scores improved at a 50 percent faster rate in reading and at a 40 percent faster rate in math. And that the things that worked were meeting every family face to face a few mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. um, sending materials home for parents to use to help their kids and staying in regular touch with families on kids progress. I feel like mm -hmm. one of the things that was really critical um, that happened successfully with COVID, because um, everyone's always talking about the negative things, I feel like the, the benefit is that teachers really learned how to communicate, um, how to get information online updated regularly. And I know that it can feel like a lot of work to do that. But I also think that the benefits far outweigh the negatives because when parents know what, oh, I see today you guys were doing math using dominoes. And there we go again. Now you've got an actual question to ask. Tell me how that worked. Should we get dominoes? Is there something we could play for a game? And, you know, a teacher could put instructions on how to play some kind of a game with addition or whatever with dominoes. So it really helps us connect more and helps families feel like I know what you're doing and all it takes is for me to quickly check mm -hmm. and we're all online at some point. Mm -hmm. Just reestablishes or make sure that it establishes a strong partnership between parents and teachers and the kids too. So they know like, you know, they're not like the middleman, like with the information or misinformation in between, but they're getting, you know, like they're just working all together for, you know, for the success of their kid. Have you experienced any teachers or admin who were hesitant about a lot of parent involvement? If so, what do you think the reasons are and and how would you handle that? I think that um, there's a couple of there's a couple of things at play in this right now in the, in the environment that we're in right now. There's a lot of parental involvement that is unwanted in the sense that um, when parents feel like they don't understand what's happening in the classroom, when there doesn't feel like there's transparency, they start to want to fight for their child. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is um, that they don't understand the difference between working with one child versus having 30 children in your classroom. Mm -hmm. So that a teacher's ability to uh, do the kinds of one-on-one -on -one assistance that parents might expect or might want um, it just can't happen because there's only one of you and there's so many of the kids. And so I think parents, when they hear that something might not go down exactly as they hope it would go down for their child, they feel a sense of you don't care about my kid. And I don't, I think there's, we can always talk about extremes on either end, right? The parents who seem like they're not involved and the parents who are much more over-involved. And I think- mm -hmm we have to try to see what works as best we can. And we really have to understand that it's very, very rare that parents don't want their children to be happy and successful in school. And so when people say, oh, they just don't care about what happens, it's really, they can't find a way 
to make that happen. And so I, I do think that if we want to help our kids the best we can, we have to figure out how to come together to see maybe you can't come read a book because you can't just leave your job. You don't have that kind of job. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's another way. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could record yourself on your phone reading a book and send it in so we could watch it. Ooh, maybe, I like that. Right. Mm -hmm. I think there's different kinds of ideas mm -hmm. that are innovative that help kids feel pride about their family. And mm -hmm. I think when kids feel proud of that their family supports them and they feel like their teacher cares about that, mm -hmm. then you they walk into the classroom feeling secure. Um, when I was teaching, I always said, you know, I don't know really how much they learned, which isn't really true. <laughs> um, but I do know that kids were looked forward to coming and seeing me in the classroom mm -hmm. and that they felt like I cared about what they did, that I made sure to say, oh, your dad's away on business. Is he back yet? Mm -hmm. Or your mom's away on business. Is um, is your dad remembering to make breakfast? Like what kind of <laughs> breakfast does he make? Uh -huh. I think you have egg on your shirt. You know, like just noticing those kinds of things, mm -hmm. I think helps kids feel like, you know, they go home mm -hmm. somewhere. And then when parents notice things, it's like they're acknowledging when you're not with me, you're in a different, you're in your own world. And I would like to know more about that. Mm -hmm. And so it really is helping the two sort of communities come together for children. Mm -hmm. And I've come up with lots of different ways to do that, but I, and which we're going to talk about, I think, but I also just think it's really important to be open to the idea that we can always learn more about how to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I know, uh, well, I teach fifth grade, so I'm an upper grade teacher. And by the time that these parents come up to upper grade, a lot of them stop volunteering or stop getting so involved in the classroom. And a lot of the upper grade teachers kind of want parents out because they feel like I think parents are watching them and like not judging them, but kind of critiquing their, you know, like management system or how like what they're teaching or what they're not teaching. Um, so I want teachers to feel more comfortable in, in inviting the parents in. Now, when I run like little rotation groups or like little centers, I do have parent volunteers and I love, I love the comments or like the, the responses that the parents have after volunteering in the classroom, they'll say, I didn't know my child acted this way in front of their peers. And so like, it's something, you know, for them to talk about with their kids or they'll like, you know, like, I think it's really important for the parents to get to know their children's friends and classmates too. And so when I see, parents get involved I see like behaviors improving too you know <laughs> and like yeah. I think that I think the students know like oh wait my you know like my mom's gonna know that I did this or I did that or like in, in positive things too like oh I want my mom to see me um doing well in my like word work group or you know things like that so whenever there's like we keep on saying like partnership whenever there's like partnership between like everybody like and it's a whole community of learners I feel like it, everything is just better, you know? Um, I, I totally yeah. agree with that. But I also think I that's where I see the most pushback um, from teachers because they'll get parents and they say parents will leave. And even though they say we're not going to talk about anything, they'll say, oh, you, you should see how low so-and-so's kid is. Oh, right. And that's really distressing. But I also think the more you get to know families and parents and, you know, that's why it's always kind of fun when you have like siblings, because you feel like you get to know those families even mm -hmm. better. And mm -hmm. the more you get to know them, the more that kind of respect comes along where they know that you don't take that kind of crap. Right. So, Right. And, and setting and setting expectations before they start volunteering in the classroom too, like right. you know, making sure you communicate. You know, these are the things that you're going to keep confidential. You know, what happens in this classroom stays in this classroom, and you know, like that kind of thing, right? Um, I do think, though, with to, to talking about the upper elementary, like I don't think you can underestimate um, how much value a, a parent reading a, a picture book has to kids, mm -hmm. no matter how old they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a couple of ways of doing it. I know, you know, there's a lot of controversy over the book situation now. Um, but I will say that I think you could easily come up with a list of, you know, 25 books that you wanted to read in the classroom. And then mm -hmm. they could be offered up to parents. Like if you'd mm -hmm. like to, read, if you connect with one of these books mm -hmm. and you want to be the one, you can come into the classroom, you can video yourself. You can just do it, like literally just do it on, on your phone and send it to us and we'll watch it. And you can, and have like an actual format where you say, 
tell people who you are, who your child is, you know, why you connected with this book, read the book, and then share a couple of questions you have for kids afterwards. So there's even with the video, there's an interaction, an interaction right. quality. Um, and I well, think well, that can be really effective no matter what. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the benefits of, you know, having gone through the pandemic too. So we could do like a zoom call, like a parent can zoom in to the class and have that interactive session with, you know, uh, with the class as well. And you were talking about a parent reading to the class. Um, Whenever that happens, I see, I'm I'm always watching the the child of the parent who's reading and they're beaming ear to ear because they're so happy that their parent is there, you know, sharing their love of reading or love of the book with their, you know, with their, their child too. So, um, yeah, I, I was just kind of picturing, as you were mentioning, that I was picturing the parent reading and the child smiling ear to ear going, that's my mom or that's my dad. I do think that that um, it can't be underestimated as a behavioral sort of management strategy for kids to feel pride, um, you know, pride in their own work, pride in their families, pride in the, you know, compliments that you've given them. And I feel like engagement is the same way with parents, like, parents need to be able to feel proud as well. And so it's so important. I think if the num- if someone asked me the number one thing I think that could get parents more involved, it's to um, send a note or make a phone call home to say something that you're proud of their child doing, or they should be proud of their child doing. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like once they think that you see their child mm-hmm. for who they are and you appreciate them, then they're more likely to want to get involved. Right. So a phone call home doesn't have to be to report some like bad incident that happened, but it could be to to praise them for something. And 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 parents will be pleasantly surprised like, oh, wow, I got a really nice phone call from your teacher today or from the office. Right. Yeah. Um, so what you mentioned kind of leads into the next question I had for you, which was what can schools what can schools do? What can teachers do to promote and encourage more family engagement, like whether it's like family a math night or, you know, some kind of a family night? Like, do you have any ideas on what we can do to promote that? I think um, the important thing to think about is that not all caring adults can participate in the same ways. Mm -hmm. So you have to be cognizant of how a a family can participate in their own way. And just because they can't come to volunteer or come to a math night doesn't necessarily mean that they can't participate in a way that their student, you know, can really respect their honor their student. Um, so I, I think you have to do a variety of things. Um, I think setting up an online portal is critical in this day and age. Mm-hmm. I think a way to share resources and supportive notes and give some, you know, I, I used to do um, the dinner table question of the night all the time. Mm-hmm. And I can, I just would make them up over the summer and then just put them in like, okay, this is the next one. This is the next one. Like, you know, ask me about this or Mm -hmm. something. And then they, um, they would have a conversation, parents and and their kids would have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of parents, a lot of people eat in front of the TV. A lot Mm -hmm. of people, um, when they sit down, they eat as quickly as possible. Like someone will make dinner or they'll wait to order dinner or whatever, and it will take an hour. And then everyone sits down 10 minutes later, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And the art of sort of conversation is really good for everybody. And Mm -hmm. so I think if you have a dinner table um, question that can really help um, on a portal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think letting parents know that their emails and messages will be responded to within 24 hours Mm -hmm. is good for two reasons. One, I think we hear some, it's a very personal thing, taking care of people's children. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that when people send something like every teacher just means they're, they're, they, they're trying, they're bringing their best to the table for whatever circumstances they're in right now. And everyone makes mistakes. I was like, I remember, you know, telling a first grade parent once the best thing about every single day is that you get to try again and kids mm-hmm. will are very accepting of you trying again. And so if you give yourself 24 hours, that means that if something's upsetting or hurts you, you can rethink it. Mm-hmm. So you don't go right back that mm-hmm. parents know, okay, it hasn't been 24 hours, so I don't need to freak out yet. So mm-hmm. it's just a really nice time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, Another thing I do that I think is really helpful is to ask parents to send you a photograph of where their child does their homework. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you can say, you know how you sit down at the table and there's the bookshelf behind you. And, and so they feel like, (laughs) how do you know know, (laughs) know something about me, you know? Uh uh So you, you help them visualize where they're going to go when they're working on their homework and where they could put something. Um, I've never heard that. I love that idea. Oh, I'm going to implement that this year immediately. <laughs> it's Thank great. You. It's really great. And I think um, another thing that happens when you do that is that parents realize there needs to be a place, that having mm-hmm. a place to do your homework, right, knowing right. where you're going to go to do that is really mm-hmm. critical. And mm-hmm. that sitting on the sofa in front of the TV with a clipboard may not be the best course of action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um always offer food and child care if you want as many parents as possible to attend a function. Mm. <laughs> so if they're coming and there's dinner and they can bring little siblings who are going to mm-hmm. be babysat by the key club or something like that, mm-hmm. you're much more likely to be able to go. Right. To eliminate um, all the reasons why they cannot make it. And so that's the second mm-hmm. part of that, which is sometimes you have to make, you know, call them personally. And that's a great way for parents to volunteer. Right. Is a parent can have a phone list, you know, as long as everybody's okay with that or whatever, and call around to say, are you planning on coming? Do you need a ride? Like, are there any barriers that you need to overcome? Like, you know, are you going to come, but you're going to be late? Okay, no problem. There's no shame there. We'll see you when you get here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, dinner will be served siblings can be taken care of and then you'll all go home together. I think when we treat schools a little more like a community center, mm-hmm. we um we we invite people to feel welcome instead mm-hmm. of to feel like, oh well, everybody else can I was just talking to someone the other day about how their child has to go to summer soccer, like preseason soccer mm-hmm. from eight to nine in the morning and from two to three in the afternoon. And I'm like, who can do that if you work, you know, who can bring their children those two times? And um, so I think the assumptions that all parents are available to bring their children somewhere or to attend something at any time is, you know, is a mistake. And I don't care if you're in a, a wealthy suburban community or, a, you know, a community that uh, that has a lot of people living under poverty the majority of both parents or both caregivers work now Mm -hmm. we have to work the world has gotten very expensive Mm -hmm. and so I think that that needs to be an assumed part of a child's life Mm -hmm. and then another tip I have that's sort of like the photograph one is um to you can google this but you you can google developmental milestones I also have in my book but you can google developmental milestones with parents for um for a range of ages. And so if you have like a child who's in fifth grade, you wanna look up a range from fourth through sixth grade for developmental milestones, and you can send those to parents. These are the kinds of things I expect for children. And I have um, a story that I um, always talk about, which is that um, my children had always been super shy, quiet kids. And when they turned about five or six years old, they got really loud and crazy and it would drive me crazy. And, um, and then I looked up a developmental chart for what to expect from them. And I read five to seven year olds may be prone to people pleasing, more regulated, acceptable emotions, bragging and boasting about accomplishments, interested in the rules, acting silly when tired, having lots of fears, mm. having a temper and being quite noisy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, they're exactly just like that. who they're supposed to be. And so Can you tell you- us the title one more time? Title of that one more time? The title of what? Developmental Milestones. Developmental Milestones. Okay, yes. thank you. <laughs> and you can, just, you can just look them up. Um, mm-hmm. at, at We Are Teachers, where I work, we also have... Um, a, ones by every single grade so teachers can look them up you can look up third grade developmental milestones Mm -hmm. and there's an article that explains them all and then how do you respond to those kinds of things because Mm -hmm. now as a I remember once when I first started teaching I was teaching um first graders and you know sometimes they pay attention and sometimes they're just all very chatty and a very experienced first grade teacher said to me when they're very chatty give them something to talk about Don't tell them to be quiet because that's futile. Instead, say, everybody turn to the person next to you and talk about this. And so then you're letting them do the things they need to do. Parents need to hear that too. Parents need to understand this is where your child is at and that's fine. Here are ways to get them involved. Excellent. 
That's great. Um, I I always love asking my uh, our guests like personal experiences, questions about their personal experience. Can you share any family engagement wins, like from your personal experience, or something that you've uh, you've heard of, or you know? Yes, I think one of the best things I did um, was I, I'm not, I wasn't someone who could volunteer very much. Um, I did love to go into the classroom um, and read books. And one of the things that's really important to me is teaching kids that you have a, um, a, your personality comes out in the books that you choose mm-hmm. and that you, the way to, to, to love books is to read books about things you love. And so I knit, um, a ton and I have lots of brothers. I have four brothers and no sisters. And so I found a whole bunch of different books, picture books that were all about those things. Mm -hmm. And then I brought them into the classroom where my, um, children were, went to school and put them up on a bookshelf and talked through them. I didn't read them. I just said, this is, I like this book because of this. And I like this book because of that. Mm -hmm. And then um, I talked to kids about um, what can you make? What would your book list be? Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. things would it be about? And it helped them kind of see that they could develop those books. Mm -hmm. And my kids will say all the time, remember when you came in and did that whole (laughs) thing or you told everybody Uh about your books? And I was like, yeah, Yeah. I do. Um, So I think that that's one of those things. I also got the principal who had never been invited into a classroom before to do that same thing. Mm -hmm. So I had someone videotape me when I was doing it. And then I went to the principal and said, this is what I did. I think you should go around into the classrooms and tell everybody what you do um, and what books you would choose. Uh And um, it's like some people are sort of awkward when they do it, but that's still lovable. Yes, I love that. Not only am I going to recruit my principal and the assistant principals to do this, I'm definitely going to encourage my parents to send in uh, maybe some videos of what they love reading and what their favorite book is. I love that. When parents are actively involved in their child's education, the benefits are far-reaching. From improved academic performance to enhanced communication skills and a stronger parent-child bond, family engagement plays a vital role in student learning. By recognizing the importance of family involvement, schools can create a collaborative and nurturing environment that empowers students to reach their full potential. All right, Kimberly, we have a segment in our episode called Tag Your It, where our listeners can write in with a question. Now, today's question comes from Timothy R. And his question is, what are some tips for first-time teachers and speaking with parents? I think the most important thing is um, to let parents know that you are going to value their children and see them right from day one. Mm -hmm. Um, And that you believe that um, educating children is a partnership that happens with parents Mm -hmm. and that um, your information will be updated and you will always be able to be reached. And that when you know information, you will let them know so that you're not going to keep things or have them chase after information. Mm -hmm. I think that it's just really important um, to let them also know that there will be times where you're going to ask parents to engage with with their child. Um, Some of that engagement will happen at home and some of that engagement will happen at school Mm -hmm. and that you really want people to reach out to you if they have a barrier to success, if they feel like they can't get there because Mm -hmm. you will help them overcome that barrier. I think once you sort of say those things um, and use that as your mantra throughout the year Mm -hmm. where you're just like, "Uh, no, I'm here. We're here together. We're a partnership together. Mm -hmm. I think it really changes the whole dynamic in the culture. Right. And what is communicated and how it's communicated. Right. And I always tell yeah. too much if you don't, if you don't, exactly. if you're not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's okay to say, I'm not sure I'll get back to you or I'm not sure. Let's work on the answer together. I always say like, keep it hot, keep it honest, open and transparent, but with the heart of care and kindness and respect. I love that. <laughs> keep it hot. Yeah. Keep it hot. <laughs> right. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being on the Schoolyard Podcast, Kimberly. Thank you for having me. It was such a treat for me. Thank you.
And Timothy, we are going to send you a Schoolyard Podcast t-shirt. Thank you so much for sending your question in. Tag, you're it. Now it's your turn to write in with a question, which we will answer here on the Schoolyard Podcast for a segment called Tag, You're It. Tag us on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, or Twitter at School Specialty and hashtag Schoolyard Tag, You're It with a question that you want answered. One question will be selected per episode to be answered by our featured guest and myself. If your question is chosen to be answered on the podcast, we'll send you a Schoolyard Podcast t-shirt. Thank you for joining us for the sixth episode of the Schoolyard Podcast. Remember to pack your curiosity and meet us back in the schoolyard for our next episode on adaptive art. Class dismissed.